in April, April. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. I was like, oh my goodness. Couldn't that first. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, but welcome to another ADHC talk. It is April 14th, which means that we are wrapping up the semester, spring semester, and we are all feeling it pretty hardcore. But I am really excited today to pre present Jerry Rowinga. Um, and we are going to talk about the future of DH, future of DH in higher education, the future of DH scholarship, just sort of all things future of DH. Uh, so yeah, Jerry, I'm going to start off with a question. How did you get here in your DH journey? Oh, I forgot to read uh -huh. your bio. That's okay. <laughs> so I'll introduce myself then, uh, just to keep that in there. Um, so I'm Jerry Waringa. I'm an assistant professor in religious studies. I'm the DH hire um, in the department. Um, and I am the incoming assistant director uh, for the Center of Digital Humanities at Princeton University and the Princeton University Library. So this is actually my last hurrah, last few weeks here at, at UA. So I'm glad to get to do this before, before departing. Um, my research looks at the intersection of, um, kind of critical data studies, American religious history, gender and technology. Um, I studied Seventh-day Adventists in my dissertation using computational text analysis, but I've kind of moved into these bigger questions of, of what is DH, how do we do computational research in history, how do we do it in the humanities, and what does that mean for knowledge production? Um, so how did I get here? By a very wandering path, um, I can kind of happenstance. I am not somebody who grew up programming. I'm not somebody who kind of was early adopter on these things beyond uh, Oregon Trail and like Microsoft Paint. So good Oregon Trail generation person here. Um, I got here because at the end of my BA in philosophy, I realized I wanted to continue in the humanities, but I wanted to focus on works that engaged outside of academia. Um, so I went to Yale Divinity for my master's degree and uh, really realized that I wanted to engage outside of academia um, and discovered that uh, the world of kind of public history and digital public history. Um, so I took a public humanities course at the graduate school there in around 2010, um, got started to think about digital projects, started experimenting with some computational text analysis in my divinity school courses, they weren't entirely sure what to do with that, but um, it was a good, it was a good effort from on all of our parts. Um, but that led me to George Mason University, which has um, one of the, the leading digital history centers, digital public history centers. Um, and so I'm one of the early generations of scholars who are actually trained in, in digital methods because the, the history graduate program there has uh, required digital history courses. And I was also able to do a minor field in what we called the history of new media, um, thinking about what is technology, what does that mean for the production of history, how do we engage with media studies, how do we engage in, in kind of critical code studies, um, which was just just starting. Um, so I got a lot of experience there on the public side of things, working with um, Digital Humanities Now, um, which I think no longer exists, Journal of Digital Humanities, which also no longer exists, um, but also the software Omeka, um, which does still exist and is, is excellent. Um, and then uh, 2015, I started working as full-time administrative faculty at the George Mason University Libraries. Um, I was the digital publishing production lead, which was a mouthful to say, and I'm person full to do. Um, it's been split into multiple roles, but uh, during that time I worked with open journal systems for the library, our dig institutional repository on DSpace, um, and kind of thinking about what a digital scholarship center would look like uh, for the library. Um, so that's kind of my, my training up to this point. I finally finished my PhD in 2019 and then started here trying to, to do that within the, the role of kind of a, a disciplinary scholar in religious studies. Um, yeah. 
yeah. wandering path to here. Lots of different experiences, lots of different types of DH work. But those experiences are so rich and give you such an expansive understanding of what a DH practitioner actually needs um, and how to, how to get there, right? Which I think yes. Um, yes. Is, is not always not always all of our paths, you know, so, so very like yours is very, um, curiosity driven, I think, and also opportunities that came your way and you have a very, very broad understanding of, um, sort of conceptually what DH Need, yeah. And, right. and how it looks when you're in different subject positions, right? So what does it look like as the graduate student? What does it look like when you're within a, an administrative faculty position in a library, kind of more of the service support role? What does it look like um, from a disciplinary faculty member? Um, and so, yeah, it, it's been, and it's kind of a, a nice thing about being in that, I would probably say third generation of DH scholars, um, in that it's still undefined. We're all kind of learning as we're going, but, um, that means that you get to try and you get to sit in different places. And I think we're still there, but, uh, there are a few more kind of direct routes. And so it's easier for people to, to specialize in some ways. Yeah. Um, but I think all of that, um that experience helps inform how what how I understand DH and how I understand different um the work to be done differently in different contexts so I understand DH to be the the critical application of computational methods um with and tools within humanities research as well as the critical development of computational systems informed by the research priorities of the humanities so I understand it to be both and both at the same time but the uh, different aspects are emphasized in different areas. So um, what I've learned in, in being in the disciplinary space and, and both in my grad school work and in the faculty position um, is that the emphasis is much more on the critical application of the methods to the content work. Um, and what I found about myself is my interest is in the critical development of those systems informed by the humanities work. Um, and right now, because DH isn't um, formally a field in the US context, it is in Europe, and I'm kind of jealous, um, but because it isn't, we, we end up doing that work in research centers like what I'm going to or in libraries um, because it doesn't fit into the disciplinary structures that, that we currently have. Right, right. So we've had some conversations about sort of the future of DH and you are super interested in that sort of development of computational methods um, and structures. What do you think uh, are some of the big future impactors that we're looking sort of we're looking down the road five years, yeah. ten years, even next year? Um, I mean, some really big technology things have happened in the past year, right? So, like, what? Yeah. What do we have going on there? in your, your vision? Yeah, so my sense of kind of top, top priorities or top things that are um, gonna be productive research areas in DH, but also primary concerns um, are around data science and machine learning. Um, I'll, I'll say more, um, around uh, education, around infrastructure first, and then also education, um, how we train people to do DH work. Um, so thinking about data science and machine learning, the launch of chat GPT turned everybody's worlds upside down, but this is actually something that's been in development here for 10 plus years, um, kind of active five, last five things have been really picking up speed. So, um, chat GPT is an example of large language models, this idea of training neural networks to be able to do predictive work with text, but kind of getting to this idea of structurally understand, well, understanding is loaded, but um, recognizing patterns in the structures of text. Um, we don't need to go into the long conversation about generalized intelligence and whether or not that is actually what we're doing here. 
as a humanities scholar, I would say no, but um, this is going on the internet. So I should probably not, not put myself out too, too hard here. Uh, so this is an area that's active research. There's been a lot of pushback um, for years from scholars such as Emily Bender, Timnit Fabru, uh, Sophia Noble, drawing attention to the, the limitations, the biases, the costs of these systems, the potential um, use of them to further uh, disadvantage populations, like this huge problem set. Um, but DH has been kind of relatively late to those conversations. Um, and, uh, which is unfortunate because I think we need to be right in the middle of it, not just in the, the limitations of the technology, but in the conversations about how to shape the development of data science as data science methods and machine learning methods um, are becoming kind of the, the standard epistemological framework. So science is increasingly data science, data driven, humanities are increasingly data driven, but what does that mean? And how do we do data work in the humanities that, um, that brings humanities ways of knowing that emphasize uh, yeah. complexity the contingency and the contextualness of data and put that at the center, as opposed to thinking about trying to find like big patterns, thinking of data as objective or solid or something that can be easily used to get your results and go, right? Find your way to make money and go. But how do we create pra epistemological practices that put that complexity, that contingency, and that context at the front and make people right. grapple with that because data is not less, is not, is not a more objective. It's in fact even more, um, more complicated because it's undifferentiated. Um, and so those, those kind of structural issues become even bigger once you are at, at data at scale, they don't go yeah. away. Um, you can't, you can't build your way out of them um, in that way. So unless the humanities figures out how to join that conversation at kind of that deep technical level and that deep epistemological level, the types of uh, knowledge that the humanities contribute are just going to be further devalued, devalued culturally. And so I think figuring out how to engage that conversation and figuring out how to make the humanities contributions front and center is kind of the big existential crisis right now in, in DH. Yeah, I think that it's just making me think of just examples of DH work that I'm seeing happen on our campus. And I'm seeing scholars who do not have formal computational training, but have very, very formal humanities training, have a vision of doing a digital project that tells them something that they wouldn't know. But as you're talking, I'm thinking about all of the barriers that they encounter, right? It, there's there's such yeah. a chasm between these big picture, big D, big H, like world of DH conundrums and challenges and opportunities. And then yeah. the practice of DH, which is often being done by folks who who aren't a part of those conversations, who are a part of their their disciplinary conversations, and they they have a dream, right? And I think that is the real opportunity that I see for DH centers um, is to try to bring those two things together. But yeah. it's a it's such a challenge, right? As far as on you know, on our campus, um, I know when I talk to people who are engaged in DH projects, they they have a, a real need for some sort of larger structural support for what they're doing. And beyond that, yeah. they're spending hours learning how to do the skills that they need in order to execute these projects. And when it comes time to put their tenure dossier together or some sort of application, um, that work, the value doesn't translate. 
right? So right. I guess my next question for you, Jerry, is <laughs> what infrastructure is necessary to yeah. support sustained DH scholarship, right? What, what infrastructure is necessary on an institutional level? Like, how do we get there? Yeah, yeah. And I think you're exactly right to draw attention to the, the role of the center in this conversation, because individual scholars, they're going to be creating data that is uh, contingent, complex, um, contextualized, but very related to their specific research. Um, and it's the center that's in the position to look across multiple projects and to start to see those larger patterns in how data can be constructed because it can see across the multiple the multiple data sets. Um, so in that sense, that sort of central place um, where people can come to to learn skills um, can uh, learn how to structure their data so that it can be put in conversation with other people's data. There's yeah. there's so much that happens when people are just learning on their own that um, is too bespoke to their individual projects because they don't yet know about metadata standards or how to structure their data so that it's reusable or, or what is tidy data and how to make their data um, work, <laughs> work with computational systems. Um, yeah. All that needs to be learned either directly or in collaboration. Um, the, the center at Princeton does a lot of, um, one of their programs is to do grant programs to faculty and students where uh, you can apply to, to go and create data. Um, and then you can apply to, to do a project with them. Um, but they have that data step because they found that a lot of people, they don't yet have the data that they need in order to build the thing that to make the vision, to make their dream, which I now have Rapunzel stuck in my head. So thank you for that to another mother of children, um, <laughs> Disney all the time. Uh, so they need a way and they need to learn how to build the data in a way that it can become important. But I think, um, thinking even broader how to make it count in a way that works we have infrastructure issues in terms of publishing for digital work and publishing for the different aspects of digital work so digital projects are data which is itself an act of interpretation and scholarship they're composed of of some sort of interface or analysis which is again an act of scholarship and some sort of presentation layer some sort of way of visualizing it which is again an act of scholarship so any digital project should be at least three components um, but so often there aren't ways to publish it with all of them connected there aren't clear ways of making that count um, the, there are, Mellon is funding a number of digital publishing initiatives, but yeah. um, the big one at Stanford that lets you kind of do your thing is, is ending at the end of this year. They're not taking on new projects. And so there's beyond ebooks, um, there's no clear line through our academic publishers or even our institutional repositories for these larger digital projects to exist as kind of first order scholars scholarly goods you can you can hack something together and i have and i'm happy to talk about how to do that um but it doesn't function well as as the thing that has been created and it's not clear how to reward all of those layers of work that they are it's not just one thing it's a living thing that's composed of multiple things right. um so that makes it a challenge and 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 that um that institutional larger disciplinary structure for it needs needs help and attention um because if we don't know how to fit it into the scholarly ecosystem then the work isn't going to be done because as you say how do you get it into a tenure dossier how do you get it into a promotion dossier how do you communicate about what it's doing in a way that makes sense to the lar those larger review committees um, and until we have some way of doing that it's always this like well you did that on the way that that's just part of your research instead yeah. of you know this is actually a scholarly contribution of itself right compounding and compounding. we have models for that over you know mm -hmm. in the sciences yes building a data set is an act of scholarship in itself 
and worthy yes. of grant funding. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that is a contribution and you deposit that data set somewhere and any number of people can use it. Right. But, but it's, that is, yeah. that is an end goal in itself. And I've been thinking a lot about DH in that yeah. sort of through that lens of, I've been looking at a lot of the projects that we have been a part of over the past years. I've only been here since October. So it's been, uh, I think I just hit my five months um, as, as the head of the ADHC, which, you know, in some ways feels like it's been longer and in some ways it feels like I just started yesterday. And, and I think about all of these projects and in my conversations with people like when somebody decides to do a DH project, they are often thinking of that third level, mm -hmm. right? That presentation level. It is the yep. presentation of the digital project that they are considering as, as the deliverable. And in my mind, I definitely have, like, we have all of these other deliverables because you have your data set. Well, like you can build another project out of that just as easily in, you know, years to come. And, you know, there's, there's just the, the, the methodology of, of processing that data and analyzing it, you know, running it through these frameworks, new frameworks are being developed. Wouldn't it be so cool to see like a legacy of several different iterations of a data set, right? Yeah. into these these final presentations but but I think the humanities historically have been so focused on that deliverable of a monograph and in people's mm -hmm. brain the the website or the Omeka collection building it out not the backside of Omeka but like the digital exhibit part of it is like what they think of as the equivalent of the monograph or right you know and it's yep. but, but it it doesn't have the same impact it doesn't have the same weight and it doesn't have the same lifespan right right so like how do we how do we fix all of these things because a, a dh project that was built 15 years ago may very well only run on a computer that is not on a network anymore sitting in somebody's office because you know technology has has radically yeah. changed so very much i think i think those are things that are so present on my mind especially as i'm looking at the way that our center is resourced and the the way that we are organized and the fact that, you know, uh, projects are continually coming in yeah. and how do you, how do you commit to maintaining them as the technology ages out? And do you keep all of those projects on a, a server when a, when a center considers itself more of an incubator, right? Than an archive and where yeah. is the line for that? And how do you honor those projects that were built, yeah. you know, under your shepherding while deciding what stays and what needs to migrate or archive, right? And then yeah. what happens to them after that? It Absolutely. is a complicated, it's such a, a complicated <laughs> like conundrum to face as, as a person sitting in a center trying to decide how best to use your resources yeah yeah you know absolutely and and uh kind of talking across that so yes the preservation piece as part of that infrastructure that still needs to be developed we still need to figure out kind of standard practices for how to archive what is archived um I know when I did my dissertation, I focused on creating web archive files of the final presentation layer. But I think what you were speaking about earlier, um, that people start when they, they're thinking about a DH project, they're thinking about that display version. Um, and that's the most ephemeral of the whole thing. 
um that's the thing that's gonna die <laughs> it's gonna disappear it's gonna become obsolete the fastest um because it's the most dependent on the technologies that are moving moving so fast the data the part that's the least rewarded in our current system is the most stable part of it and it's the most useful for other for combining with other things for future projects um and the analysis bit sits in the middle right um in, in both cases, it's it's that middle middle stage thing. So how to shift, um, how to increase support for doing data work, both financially because of the time it takes, and it takes a ton of time to make usable data, which connects to education. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but also how to reward it as as the scholarly endeavor that it is. And that's what I focus a lot in in teaching and getting students to think about data is just keep coming back to how much um, the schema you set up with the structure that you're going to impose on the things in the world that you're trying to turn into computational data, how much interpretation is going into that, because you do not capture everything, you never capture everything, um, you will never capture everything, it's all making choices about what you're going to capture and how you're going to capture it and how you structure it determines what you can get out on the analysis side, which determines what you can display. Um, so I would love to shift the priority of the two to make the data um, that that gold piece. Um, but you need one hundred percent concur. <laughs> but that's where that's where I am too. Yeah. I had a graduate uh, student in my office the other day trying to figure out how to make a story map or a timeline. I have a lot of students who need to do those kinds of things, and yeah. I was trying to describe like first collecting your assets and sort of documenting them in a spreadsheet. And they just looked at me like I had said something that like, they were just like, and that happens almost every time. It's like, yeah. they look at me and they think that they've saved a couple of bookmarks in their web right. browser. And right. then they start writing and they plug in some URLs and it's like, no, you have to like yes. document it in this this way that collects the the descriptive data that you need so that yeah. so that when you're building out your digital project, you have something to put into it. Yep. Because that yep. URL is not going to be be the thing, right? You need right. You, title, you, author, or creator, publisher, date. Right. Right. Um, and I know as someone who does social media research, like yeah. there's tons of metadata that I have to collect that has to do with like ethical th thresholds that I've set for myself as a researcher. Right. These are not even things that that somebody may necessarily need to know on a item by item basis because they're not going to see it but if something reaches a threshold I treat it differently in the way that I refer to it in my scholarship yeah. than if yeah. something doesn't meet that threshold right and right it's like yeah, it's that data document. and capturing it and documenting it in a in a, an organized and clean fashion um has such heavy ramifications for the execution of any project that happens oh, with that data. Yeah, right. 100%, 100%. And in the humanities, I think in the sciences it's different or social sciences, but in the humanities, we are not often, this is not our, this is not our way of approaching the world, right? We're, we're very used to finding patterns in text, um, but we, and we know how to cite things in footnotes, um, but it's a very, it's a, like three more steps of organization that you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that aspect of education kind of building in these these kind of computational skills. But the I think the biggest challenge for education in DH in the humanities is the model that we have that it's very single authored individual work. Um, so the sciences have a lab model. You 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 are always a co-author on papers. In the humanities, this is not yet, this is not a norm. Um, there are places where you can find it, um, and I, I look to them as often as I can, but um, to ask students on um, undergraduate, master's, PhD projects to do all of that 
work of data creation, as well as the analysis, as well as the presentation, it is too much. As someone who has tried it, it is too much um, to do in the timeframes of those projects. And you end up with not as great of a result because you're trying to do all, all of the things. Right. So um, education that shifts to much more of a collaborative research agenda where the, the data creation isn't a single person's a single person's venture. It's a larger question that different aspects are explored so that uh, there's always data creation, but perhaps you're augmenting a data set because there's an aspect of the thing that needs to be captured to answer your question that wasn't originally. Or um, you need to expand the data set in order to to reach a little further in time or to a, a parallel group mm -hmm. but instead of having this focus on um, dh projects I, I used to want to think they could be done individually and I, at this point I, I have had enough experience to realize they cannot they really cannot the the projects to do well need to have a joint effort um, in yeah. some way yeah um, and for students to enter into DH as a field, um, they need to be able to join the things that are in progress to learn how to do that data work, to build on that data in order to get to an end result in a reasonable amount of time um, so that they can set up their own project that does that work. Um, and in this case, there are examples of this um, viral text out of Northeastern, the Colored Conventions Project, spun out dissertations. Um, but they're very uncommon. And I, I would love to see that become much more, um, figure out how to do that within the humanities, how to give that model um, a chance to, tr to try. Because I, I don't think digital humanities scholarship will be able to attain what it could be unless we move into that that model. If it stays the single author thing, they're, they're gonna stay small because that's all you can yeah. do. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like we're making small incremental steps towards these ideas with yeah. linked open data and um, the experimentation of crowdsourcing data collection yeah. and uh, a few things like that. But it's it's taking that extra step of viewing it as a data set that you're building and then viewing your own scholarship and presentation as a separate entity, right? Um, the other thing that I keep on coming back to as I'm hearing you talk is that idea of contextualization and just the, the understanding that often when you're building data sets, it's hard to capture that contextualization within the data yeah. set. So if you're building a data set that lots of people are using, how do you communicate the contextualization of the data set or how the data was gathered yeah. or what it represents, what types of biases it may include? What is the, I, 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 I always try to think of my, my um, in my talk about building data sets or starting projects, sort of the scoping, like, like establishing yeah. scope when we're, when we're writing a computer program, we establish a scope, right? Yeah. When we're developing a data set, we need to establish a scope. And that scope talks about the purpose of what we're trying to do, right? Like, yeah. so how do we create data sets that articulate clear scope and context so that other scholars can come and use it, even if we're not around to, to communicate those things like person to person? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I have two examples that I, I keep looking to, um, but I'm kind of continually trying to figure out um, how best how best to make it useful. So I'm going to pull something up real quick, That's just fantastic. so I make sure I have the authors correct. Um, there it is. Yes. Okay, uh, so the one example that um, I would point to and that I've, I've had students try making one of these um, with mixed results, but overall, I think it was good. Um, and that's a, a data sheet. So uh, referencing here the paper, um, would it help if I throw it into the, the link into the chat? Sure. Um, yeah, and I then I if you can it, capture that. I'll put it, yeah. Okay, uh, but it's data sheets for data sets um, published by, oh, and it's not letting me copy, hang on. 
Um, this is uh, Gebru and uh, Hannah Wallach and Kate Crawford and Jamie um, Morgan Stern, a whole collection of scholars. Um, but it's focused for those these large data sets um, that are used to chain to train um, large algorithms. Mm -hmm. Um, and it provides a structure for documenting, like, what is in this data set? Um, what are some of the potential ethical risks? Who are the, the persons? What are the limitations of the data set? Um, so it's a document that's supposed to sit with the data set um, and gives that, that context. Yeah. And I think that's really helpful. Um, I would love to find a way to make that information visual and also um, kind of force you to go through it to get to the data. Because, well, yes, and we need to do this documentation work. It's still too easy to just like skip it and get the data and do your right. training stuff because right. that's where the, it's rewarded. You're rewarded if you can optimize the algorithm on whatever data, um, not if you can train. Yeah. You get you read get that, <laughs> and you don't read the read me. You just you just grab, you just take the you thing, the yeah. the and I'm as guilty of it as the next yeah. person, right? Because we're, yeah. we're we're all moving fast. But um, I love this example. I think it's really instructive to make students write it because it it helps when they're yeah. making their own. When they I've had them create data sets, so I make them write something like this to help them. Like, oh yeah, I have to think about that. Oh yeah, I need to think about that. On the humanities side of things, the example that I've been um, kind of thinking with is Catherine Bode's World of Fiction, um, and I'll throw another link in. Um, uh, uh, I can't type and talk. Hang on. So uh, this is a computational text analysis based book um, that looks at fiction in that got reprinted in, in uh, Australian newspapers. And I'm trying to find the digital part of it. Hang on one second. Do, 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 read online, there should be a link. Uh, but she proposes this structure of the, this is a scholarly edition of a literary system. Uh, where she is documenting um, how the titles that she was able to identify within the Australian newspaper collections. Um, and then, uh, let me get the link to the appendix. Um, kind of, instead of just saying, I, I found a ton of literature um, and here are the patterns in it, that all of those literature pieces are really well documented in terms of their metadata and how they relate um, so that you have a really clear sense of what are the contours, what is the context of this data set. Um, and as a historian, context is, is really important. I don't know how to interpret the patterns that I've found if I don't know the context of, okay. of the documents that came in, if I don't yeah. know the the extents of things. We, we deal with, with spotty records all the time. And this is not to say that I need to like have the whole world because you can't. Um, but some sort of information to have a sense of where things start and stop of yeah. um, the quality of the data, which is important for me in text analysis, um, how good the OCR is because we're working, working with historical sources, all of that sort of information and yeah. figuring out how to create um, an interface that um, communicates if you, that. If you can't um, find the, oh, there it is. I was like, if you, if you can't find it, you're welcome to send it to me afterwards so that I can just pop it into. That's the book <laughs> part. There's a, a second part that's the actual interface that I will find after and send right, to you. Yeah, because, just yeah. just shoot me an email afterwards. <laughs> great. Uh, it might be linked in there. I just can't find it quickly. Um, but I really love this example. And this is the one I'm trying to to build off of with the materials I have um, collected from Seventh-day Adventists in the 19th century. So the denomination digitized a whole bunch of their periodicals. That's what I've used for computational text analysis. Um, but it's important to know the history of the publication, how many of them are still, like how many issues that we have versus how many issues that were published, who were the editors in different years, and all of that right. informs how you interpret there's a spike in this topic in a particular year. Well, 
what's going on in that year. I need all that contextual information to know. So how do we build that sort of interface that does, Mm -hmm. makes that apparent, not just the model. So as a historian, I love the model, but I need to put that model in context. Um, So trying to figure out how to do that. Um, So that's where my, my interest in research is right now. That's, um, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that stuff. It's, it's just such a, it, it, I, 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 um, I find myself just rabbit trailing through these ideas, you know, <laughs> <Same. just> like, <laughs> like, but, but this one, and then that brings to another one and another one. Let's pull back to, we have, we have maybe five minutes left or so. Um, let's pull back to something super pragmatic that you've been dealing with for the last couple of years since you've been here at Alabama, and that is training future scholars. Mm. What do you mm-hmm. think are the top three things that we need to keep just sort of in in our vision? Like, what are the three things that, that graduate students, for example, um, need and then if we think about future yeah. scholars as already tenured professors who wander into dh yeah like what how does that look different for them like how do we train them how, what are like the top three things that people need so this is going to be a roundabout way to answer that but i will give some kind of patterns and things i've focused on in teaching um i would say the first thing that it comes to mind is uh, digital natives are a myth. Um, we all now live in a world that's mediated by computation, but um, the students need to be started at, like I, have, I keep starting at the beginning. Um, orientation to machines, knowing how file structures work, knowing how to navigate your computer, not just through uh the GUI whether that's the mouse or the the points and click and actually I think it's getting harder um because the interfaces are getting better and so we are further and further removed from the computational side of our computer systems and we're more in this kind of visual consumption space I'm going to sound so old um but in terms of education it's true yeah in terms of breaking it down people are thinking of that visual display element um, in many ways, because they don't have to interact with the, the underbelly, the insides of their machines. Um, and so education for doing this sort of work needs to start at, at the data layer, at, at thinking about data. It needs to start at the kind of computational systems layer, how, how your files work, how computer programs work, how to take your data and work with it in multiple files instead of thinking of your data as Excel data. It's it's not, it's just structured data. It can be played with across all these different things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say that's the first thing that, I, that I've that i noticed that, that there is no assumed knowledge, <laughs> regardless of age, there is no assumed knowledge of how computer systems work. Mm-hmm. I would say the students who are coming up have a much keener sense of what potentially could be done um, because they're they're willing to experiment with things or they've been hearing things. Um, so they're they're aware of machine learning algorithms, they're aware of kind of those yes. big concepts, but the nuts and bolts of how to get there, we're all starting at the same spot. Um, so focusing on those basic computational skills, um, which should be part of a general education experience um would be would be the first thing um in terms of people entering i think for, especially for humanities people um starting with the computation i have found is not the way to go mm-hmm. the way to go is starting with the question that connects to what they're interested in whether that's disciplinary or just kind of how yeah, it's largely disciplinary, but it's the, um, I want to know something that's related to things I care about. Um, so I usually start my computational courses, people in the computer science will probably have small heart attacks, but like we start with the problem and how do we fix it? How do we get here? And then we work backwards to the more fundamental concepts. Um, because I've found both when I was learning and in teaching students, 
I know computers do math really well. I know you need to know logic in order to get your computer program to work. If you start a humanities scholar with math, you've lost them. <laughs> They're not gonna stick with you to figure out how to connect all the pieces to get to the thing that they wanna do. So right. I start with the thing they wanna do, and right. then we work back to try to fill in the gaps. And but we're not trying to be computer programmers. We're not, we're not writing papers for computer science journals and that's okay. It's gonna be a gappy thing, but it's gonna get the job done. And then hopefully we can collaborate to do it better. Um, so that'd be the second thing is starting, starting with the end, flip, flip the switch or flip the script on the, the teaching part. Um, and I think that's also for both students and people entering later. And then um, just more opportunities for training. And it's been unfortunate COVID kind of took a big whack out of a lot of the kind of extracurricular opportunities for DH training. There's still DHSI in Victoria, and I just saw Guelph's version in Canada is, is relaunching itself. So that's fantastic. Um, but there are very few places to go and learn kind of discrete skills, mm -hmm. um, which are important. Um, but then also kind of building into the disciplinary discussion is yeah. how do we use these within our methods? How do we think critically about the method? Not just, well, right. I can write a computer program or I can make a website, but how does this actually integrate into what we do as religious studies scholars, as historians, right. um, as literary scholars? Right. That'd be kind of where I'd, I'd tackle that. Yeah. Yeah, everything that you're saying makes so much sense from just even my past five months of experience yeah. here, you know. <laughs> right, seeing the projects, hearing what people are concerned about, yeah. Yeah, I love waking up every day and coming and talking to people about their really fun projects. It is great. It's like my favorite thing. I just, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> that is the advantage of that, uh, that sort of role. And I think yeah. DH gets to do a lot of that, um, hearing what people are doing and start thinking about connections across yeah. Um, yeah. and those larger patterns. And that that's the exciting part to me. Yeah. Well, Jerry, I think I'm going to try to wrap this up unless you have any other questions. No, I think... Um, I I would love to ask some questions, but I also have to go back to teaching. So um, yeah, yeah. I will see well, we'll do it again then. Time. Yes, we'll, we'll do, do it, it again, again um, because this is an ongoing series. So Excellent. I can I can invite you back. <laughs> after we'll have so much to talk about. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. You are so generous, and I personally want to thank you. Over the last five months, you you've helped me think about things and get settled and like uh, helped me find context and you've made lots of connections for me. And I just really appreciate you so much. And I'm sad to see you leave UA, but I'm excited to have you as a library colleague. Yeah, it's be fun. It's and um, I hope that we get to work together um, as we move forward in our, in our respective positions. So, uh, Thank you. Absolutely. So thank thank you. you. And we're very glad to have you you here in this position. So, and thank you for all your work in organizing these. This is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I'm having a lot of fun with all of it. It Good. just makes me spend so much time with people listening to their their work. So um, but yeah, so this concludes our presentation today. I hope folks join us again next week for Carrie Hill. Uh, she's the Digital Scholarship Librarian down at Auburn, and she is going to talk about her own research. Um, her, she does scholarship and fan fiction, and it's going to be so much fun. So cool. I hope folks join us then. And once again, thank you so much, Jerry. Welcome. Thank you.